Okay, so I'll start now. So uh, hi everyone. Uh, today I'll be presenting on uh, Punjab chemicals and crop. Uh, I feel it's a very differentiated uh, agri chemical company, and I'll talk more about it. Uh, to start off, just some disclaimers. This is only for education purpose. I'm not a registered analyst. I hold uh, stocks in the company and I have bought in the last 30 days uh, and this doesn't represent the views of my organization or my employer. Uh, so I'll just uh, quickly take everyone through the Agchem value chain again, just to uh, put things in broad context. So we start with basic raw materials uh, using which we make intermediates, uh, after which uh, we make uh, active ingredients or technicals, uh, which give uh, power to a pesticide to kill pests. Uh, we can have genetic uh, active ingredients or patented ac active ingredients. Uh, using these active ingredients, uh, there are small contractors who make formulations, which are finally marketed. We, in India, we have uh, both kinds of companies who do domestic marketing, so marketing of formulations uh, uh, in India, uh, as well as overseas. And then finally, we have the retailing operations. So today I'll talk about uh, the active ingredient space and a company operating in that space, which is uh, Punjab Chemicals. Uh, a little bit of history about this uh, company. So it's a very old company, uh, which was established in the 1970s. Uh, they went on a very big expansion spree in the 2003 to 8 uh, era, uh, where they tried to become, position themselves as a global Akim formulator. So having presence in regulated markets and selling their own pesticides in their own brands. And this was done on the basis of uh, debt funded acquisition. Uh, and this backfired for them because uh, 2008 was a global financial crisis year, and they also had some factory fire issues in 2008. As a result of which, uh, their net worth became negative. They were very leveraged. And as I've highlighted on the balance sheet, like the reserves became negative. Uh, they had very high borrowings uh, and things uh, did not work out well for them. Uh, the transition uh, or the pivot which the management did was somewhere in 2016 uh, when they uh, changed the positioning of the company from being a formulator uh, to contract manufacturing the technicals for other formulators. Uh, so they pivoted uh, their business model uh, towards contract manufacturing in 2016. Uh, at the same time, they reduced uh, debt. So they did it uh, by selling non-core assets. Uh, the promoters brought their own money in uh, and settled with the banks. Uh, so the promoters lent money to the company and then the company paid off uh, their leverage uh, and they did not dilute uh, this equity. Uh, they did not dilute equity in this time period. And this is uh, visible on the balance sheet. So in the first part of the last decade, we see like uh, high borrowings, uh, negative reserves, whereas uh, things started transitioning or changing in 2016. Uh, and uh, uh, borrowings came down and reserves went up. Uh, and in all this time, there was no equity dilution. So all this was done uh, without diluting uh, the minority shareholders. Although I have to say uh, that the promoters lent money to the company and these this money was lent at high rates. So somewhere between 12 to 15%. Uh, yeah, so uh, just to see like what has happened in the last five years since the business model changed, uh, sales has grown at a, uh, a kind of a mediocre rate, which is around 12%, uh, but there has been a huge shift uh, in the value add which the company does. So the EBITDA has grown from uh, very low numbers of 15 crores. Uh, last year, they did about 140 crores of EBITDA and they were loss making in FI 16, 17, and they are now very profit making. They make 80, 90 crores of profit now. Uh, and uh, this year they should be able to cross 100 crores of profitability. Uh, if you look at the geographical segmentation, uh, where they sell their products, uh, so in the last five years, uh, India has been, India and Europe has been uh, markets in which they have grown very fast. Uh, they also do a lot of exports to Japan and the other markets, uh, it hasn't grown, but uh, they have mostly focused on regulated markets, especially uh, European Union. Uh, so uh, Punjab Chemicals has three business segments. Uh, the first one is Agri Chemical. This accounts for 70% of their revenues. So this is the biggest segment for them. Uh, in this, uh, they deal with large uh, Agri Chemical uh, multinational companies such as UPL, Arista, Nippon, Kayaku, Adama, Kureha. So all the big, uh, big names uh, in this sector. Uh, they, they manufacture technical uh, for these large uh, formulators and they do it on longer term contract basis. So five year contracts where uh, both the input prices and shipping costs are included in the pricing. So they kind of get a processing fee. Uh, 
they do uh, generate a reasonable gross margins. So they generate somewhere around 40% gross margins. Whereas if you look at the average uh, generic AI manufacturer, they make 25 to 30% gross margin. Uh, currently, they have five to six molecules uh, in their basket, which is making more than $10 million of annual sales or 100 crores plus annual sales. Uh, uh, three of them, which the management has highlighted in the past, are Metamitron, Metconazole, and Diflufenicam. Uh, a, a good part of their longer term contracts is a part of the capex is actually funded through customer advances, which we'll also go into detail in the subsequent slides. Uh, management has mentioned that most of the capex that they undertake is 50% uh, of that is funded through customer advances and 50% uh, company put its own money. Uh, so that's about the agri-chemical division. The second division for them is intermediates or specialty chemical division, which is 16% of their sales. Uh, in this division, they supply high value, low volume intermediates to global MNCs. Uh, and these are very, very high value intermediates. Uh, uh, their price is going anywhere up to 50 to $60 per kg. And they provide these to very uh, renowned MNCs. So we can see clients like Sigma, Aldrich, Azelis, Prenta, uh, so like the big names in Europe. Uh, they, they have recently been working on establishing new relationships for intermediate supplies to pharma companies. Uh, they are mostly focusing on uh, retroviral uh, companies or ARV companies uh, for supply to European markets. Uh, an interesting keynote is when you are supplying intermediates uh, for pharma companies who then subsequently sell it to European market, your facility does not have to be audited by the EU. So you don't have to get an EU GMP certificate. Uh, it's only the customers uh, who have to audit your facilities because you are providing certain intermediates uh, from your factory. Uh, and uh, the focus has mostly been on import substitution products. So where India is dependent on uh, the globe and they're trying to bring in new products, which are import substitution in nature. And the third division for them, which is the smallest is the industrial division. In this, they mostly make food grade uh, phosphoric acid, uh, which uh, is supplied to man beverage manufacturers such as Coca-Cola, Pepsi. Uh, so basically this brings in the fizz uh, in, in the drinks. Uh, they have very long-term contracts. Uh, they have very long-term relationships with companies like Coca-Cola, uh, supplying to their Indian factories for the last 20 plus years. Recently, they have been extending these relationships to their other factories, uh, and they have been able to uh, get into uh, supply, get into supply contracts uh, to the Korean factories, Singapore and Thailand. They've also been in discussion uh, with the uh, with the person who sits uh, at the head in Iceland. So they are trying to expand these relationships to supply to other global markets. Uh, so um, in this presentation, I'll mostly focus on the biggest segment, which is the Akim. Uh, well, I try to uh, explain what differentiates Punjab Chemical in terms of capabilities and business model. Uh, so uh, I just list out the things which I find very interesting about the company. Uh, they focus on very niche molecules uh, where they are uh, the only manufacturer or one of the very few manufacturers out of India. Uh, they focus on very premium customers, as I also highlighted in the couple of slides back. They focus on regulated markets where your margins are higher and your working capital is also better. Uh, in all the products they, are, they make, uh, in, in a large band of their products, they are fully backward integrated uh, to the basic raw materials. So they are very cost competitive, which we can also see in their gross margins, which is higher than the industry. Uh, and all this uh, while the working capital is the lowest uh, in the industry. And now we'll go through each of these points one by one. Uh, so when I say niche molecules, I'll give a few examples. Uh, so three of the molecules which they have disclosed openly, one of them is metamethron. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a $150 million uh, molecule, and they have 60% global market share. Uh, in global markets, uh, it's Adama and UPL who, supply, who control most of the market, uh, and uh, Punjab, controls about 60 to 70 percent of the supplies to Adama and UPL. Uh, so they have very large market share in Metamethron. Uh, then I'll highlight another molecule which is Diflofenicam. They are the only company in India making Diflofenicam. Uh, they, they are a couple of other companies but none of them make it at scale. Uh, I'll, though it's not mentioned on this slide but there's another molecule recently which they have started making which is Thydoscylam uh, which is uh, being exported to Nippon Kayaku in Japan. Again the only company uh, in India to have uh, to manufacture these molecules. So they focus on very niche molecules uh, and they try to get huge market shares in these molecules. The second point uh, about premium customers. So this uh, has been repeatedly uh, mentioned by the management uh, in their con calls uh, that they have all the uh, big names in active industry. So Adama, Kureha, 
Nippon, Corteva, Syngenta. So all the uh, so a lot of Japanese MNCs and also a lot of European MNCs in their client roster. And they want to grow more in these companies because uh, these are very big companies with very big supply chain. And it's, it's hard to break into their supply chain, but once you do, scaling up uh, becomes reasonably easier. Uh, their focus has been mostly on regulated markets. And if, uh, we, sh uh, if we see uh, where the growth is coming from, uh, the highest amount of delta is coming from Europe, where they're also very, very strong. Uh, in the last five years, I think Europe has grown at 28% in terms of sales. Uh, it's interesting to see that they also do quite a bit of exports to Japan, uh, which is one of the highest realization markets in uh, in agrochemical. Uh, not a lot of Indian companies are, are able to export to Japan. Most of the Indian companies import technicals from Japan. So that's an interesting uh, thing to observe. Uh, uh, another point about backward integration of the company. So here I've uh, mentioned the, uh, uh, the main listed uh, Akkem companies uh, who manufacture technicals uh, and Punjab has one of the lowest amount of imports uh, in, uh, as a proportion of their raw material cost. Uh, so they are highly backward integrated and they have limited uh, dependence on imports uh, and the key raw materials which they import is hydrazine, hydrate and metamethron uh, and both are sourced at longer term contracts and in, an interesting point for hydrazine is uh, Gujarat Alkalis has recently started uh, production of hydrazine uh, in their plant uh, and Punjab plans to buy from them. So the import dependence is supposed to go down even further, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, in terms of supply chain uh, uh, reliability. And all this has translated into reasonable gross margins. So Punjab's gross margin is shown by the uh, by the blue line. The only two companies in India which make uh, much higher gross margins are PI Industries and India Pesticides. Uh, the others are, have gross margins similar or lower to this. Another company which is an exception uh, in terms of gross margins is Anupam Rasayan. They make obscenely high gross margins, but they also have a very differentiated business model. Uh, so there are few players making much better gross margins than Punjab. Uh, and if you look at the working capital cycle of Punjab, uh, it's shown in uh, in blue color and we can see like uh, it's the shortest working capital cycle uh, uh, in the industry uh, so um, i've highlighted a lot about uh, what's working for them uh, what can be the risks point uh, risk elements so they have very high dependence on upl i think 37 to 38 percent of their sales comes from upl and about 15 16 uh, percent comes from arista which was acquired by upl so in a way upl dependence is almost 55 percent for them uh, however, I have to differentiate that UPL uh, manufactures generic uh, pesticides, whereas Arista uh, is a is more of a patented life science uh, life sciences company. Uh, so the product portfolio of Arista is uh, is materially different from UPL. Uh, they have uh, the higher cross margins that uh, Punjab has shown has not yet translated into premium EBITDA margins, and that's I think to do much more with scale. Uh, now they are doing thousand crores revenue run rate. Uh, so they should have scale benefits, which should uh, improve their beta margins. But so far, uh, uh, their beta margins are still uh, lower than the industry. Uh, in the past, they've had problems with factory fires. So one of the reasons for their bankruptcy or the tech problems that they had in 2008-9 was because one of the factories uh, got fire. Even recently in 2020, they had a fire in one of the factories and due to which FI20 numbers look muted. Uh, and this is a problem for all chemical companies, factory fires. And then if, if there's any change in the business model away from contract manufacturing, this can be a risk element. Uh, and in, in this industry, if you ever violate IP of, of your customer, uh, that's a terminal risk. Uh, so these are the risk elements which I, I could have uh, thought about. Uh, just as a disclosure, I have been invested in Punjab chemicals and I have bought shares in the past one month in my detailed portfolio. Is at this link below, and I'm not a registered analyst. And with this, I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, Harsh, what is the market cap of this? I think it's around 1600 crores right now. 16, oh, it's pretty small then. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's not a very big, uh, this whole Akim space, uh, there are no big companies except PI, like everyone else, PI and UPL are the big ones, everyone else is less than a billion dollar, and this is one of the smaller ones. Okay, okay. So, you, you know, you said they, they did aggressive 
uh, expansion in 2003 to 7 is that the reason they are taking a, they are taking a cautious approach now yes also uh, the expansion in that time period was uh, tried so uh, they wanted to become one of the mncs they wanted to have uh, the big name uh, so they wanted to go the upl way in some ways they wanted to have their own marketing presence in all the regulated markets which is a high entry barrier business and it's also very hard to break in uh, it it did not go very well for them last time uh, and after which they had to pivot the business model uh, rather than being a competitor to these mncs they decided to become partners and so far the results are there to see uh, they have done very well since the pivot uh, but if they again want to go back there then all bets are off Uh, because that's a very different business model of formulation versus technical manufacturing how is the management group as such is it well, so this is one of the shroff group companies <laughs> shroff group is very renowned in agri chemical i think they control a large part of the indian agri chemical space uh, he he's a family relative uh, to the upl directors as well uh, uh, this company was founded as a joint venture between excel industries Uh, and the Punjab government and the current promoters. So even if you look at the shareholding, Excel Industries still holds, I think, a good amount of stake in the company. Uh, and uh, yeah, although the promoter holding would look low at forty percent, but if you combine all the Shroff Group of companies, I think the promoter holding, the actual holding of the Shroff Group is north of seventy percent. Okay. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good one. at a very high level and what is the sort of pricing arrangements they have with the upl and maybe if you know i mean typically what is their arrangement if not specifically for punjab chemicals but these suppliers to agchem companies and is it a fully so, pass through model or what's the sort of arrangement they have so uh, there are two kinds of models which i've come across that upl does one is a conversion uh, cost model where upl gives you all the raw material everything and they pay you for job work uh okay. so this is very low cost margin uh and you are basic basically getting paid because they are using your machines and your labor yeah. uh and you are running some processes for them uh, so this is generally uh, what a lot of uh, i think any cl industries also does quite a bit of it uh, aimco pesticides starts this for upl and most of these guys make 7 to 8% ebitda margins so i think uh, mm-hmm. for that business model rosi is very high because you don't need to put up cap- capital you already have your factory and you're just letting someone else like you are running your factory for someone else so it's a low margin but high roci business uh, and then the second model which they have for upl uh, is they uh, register their own technical uh, in let's say europe so uh, let's say metamethron is a big uh, molecule for them so they'll register uh, the technical in the name in their own name uh, and then upl or let's say adama when they are uh, selling metamethron in europe uh, they will in their formulation dossier they will put punjab as a supplier so once you are in in the in the final dossier of a formulator it's a very sticky business model because it's it's very hard to change your supplier because you need to go through the entire regulatory process of getting another uh, modification in your application so that kind of business model has much higher gross margins uh, so for punjab i think uh, the job work proportion is about 150 crores out of 1000 crores is 15% and the rest 85% is Uh, from coming from their own registrations got it that self full and typically how many suppliers do they have for each technical it's generally yeah that's a very customer cent- uh, uh, centric thing different customers will approach it differently uh, i would say 2 to 3 is the sweet spot for most customers uh, hmm. and punjab uh, in in its incremental contract it's trying to be the plus one supplier so it's trying to be the second supplier so I mean, typically the growth would be that you sort of get one molecule and most molecules would have a j curve it stabilizes then you move on to the next molecule yeah. so the growth for a technical a supplier yeah so a uh, technical for a uh, sorry growth for a technical supplier is really dependent on how the formulator is able to market his final product uh, generally what happens is let's say uh, i am upl i get a registration in switzerland Uh, so all of a sudden i'm starting to push my uh, uh, push my pesticide into switzerland but then uh, maybe after 3 months i get a uh, registration in bulgaria so now i can ha- control more volumes so as as and when you keep on getting new registrations uh, the volume increases so 
it generally requires about two to four years uh, from the first time you're supplying a molecule to its optimum utilization. So far, management has gone for molecules uh, which are smaller in size, so around 80 to 100 crores is what they target uh, based on their capacity. Uh, and it takes them, and we have also seen this in the past in data, uh, that it takes them two to four years uh, to scale to full utilization for a given molecule. So I think diflufenican is a good example. Uh, they started, I think, in 2018 or 2019, uh, and it took them until 2022 to become, for it to become like a 100 crore molecule. Uh, recently, they have uh, do, they have been doing the same thing uh, for thiocyclam. Uh, so they they started manufacturing it last year. This year, they are scaling up, and probably in a couple of years, once the customer gets all the required registrations, they'll be able to uh, run their factories at optimum utilization. So that's how it generally works. It takes two to four years for optimum utilization. All right. So I mean, but I mean, there is growth even within the same molecule. It's not that the molecule that these people get is mostly a saturated sort of a molecule which does not have much growth. I mean, even yeah. with this saturated molecule, you can move to new markets. Yes. So most of the, so the, uh, once you are in the market for a few years, then the incremental volume growth will obviously be low uh, because there are other molecules also coming up every few years. Uh, so the incremental growth is generally by, uh, for, a, for a technical manufacturer, it's by getting into dossiers of different formulators and then different formulators putting you on their dossier for different markets. So that's like the chain of growth. So you try to get more customers and then the customers try to register in multiple markets. And like for this year, if you look at one of the molecules that Punjab makes, sales has, are, are about, have almost doubled. And that's because the end customer was able to get registration in a few more markets as a result of which they could procure more volumes. So it's kind of a gradual ramp up, but once you get the registration, it's kind of a hockey stick. Got it, got it, got it. Very helpful. Thanks. Uh, Harsha, one, one more thing. Is this is a very energy intensive business, right? So is it going to be affected by you know whatever happening in the higher energy prices in Europe? Yeah, so uh, there are two aspects to it. Uh, so one is uh, how it affects uh, Indian players. Uh, and the second is how it affects global players. So with high energy prices, a lot of technical supplies are uh, moving to China and India specifically, because these two are the bigger hubs. China is the biggest and India is uh, comes after that uh, in terms of Akkem production. Uh, so th there is a tailwind of manufacturing moving from developed markets to developing markets, which has also been a tailwind for like 30 years now. It's It's been a very long tailwind. Uh, and now India is benefiting because a lot of suppliers also want another, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, formulators want another supply outside of China or a supply in a second geography so that they can the supply chain can be more reliable. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, now for the Indian technical manufacturer, if energy prices go up, it also impacts that guy. Uh, so uh, maybe it impacts them less than a European manufacturer, but it also impacts them because at the end of the day, it's a very energy intensive uh, thing. Uh, I've seen uh, a couple of differentiated insights into this is companies operating out of Punjab are able to uh, use uh, certain raw materials which are not directly coal dependent so they can use, uh, you know, uh, what do we call it in, in English, like the than which comes out at the end of a harvest season. They can use those uh, as a fodder for fuel for generating electricity or for generating heat, not electricity. Uh, and they're able to use that. So a, a, a lot of industry is kind of my yeah. A lot of industry is kind of migrating to using husks to produce energy. So trying to move away from classic coal or trying to reduce the amount of consumption of coal, which is also beneficial for them in ESG metrics. But in the short term, they get impacted. So I think this year Punjab has been impacted and they have lost a couple of percentage of margins because of higher energy cost. But over the longer term, what uh, in terms of risk? Uh, uh, management companies try to use more innovative things such as rice husks, uh, which are much lower in cost versus coal. But that's like a longer term trajectory, which any industry moves to, like try to find lower and lower uh, power cost or alternatives. Okay, yeah, good, good. Thank you. Um, hey, Hast, a nice presentation. Um, I have one question. So when they sign uh, to produce or manufacture the technicals with the clients, 
do they also get the process how to do it and is that also bound by law that they cannot share or do so they have multiple kinds of contracts so some of the contracts are where uh, the ip is given by the or the technical manufacturing capabilities are given by uh, the formulator or the final customer themselves uh, so i think those kinds of molecules are about for them in terms of the product things scale of things i think around 30% of the acm revenues come from these kinds of molecules so the process is itself given by the innovator uh whereas the rest they develop their own processes uh so it's a mix uh, of things but also uh, these processes like where the molecule is patented and the process is patented and they are just being given by the innovators it's also very high margin business these businesses and they are also sticky because of trust issues right actually this whole sector if you are able to get your own registration for a technical and if the formulator mentions that okay i'm buying from this technical supplier it's a very sticky relationship because unless you beef up or unless you screw up like nobody wants to go back to the authority. like on average it takes 3 to 6 years to get a registration nobody wants to go through that much pain like the generation of molecules change that time period so it's a very sticky relationship once you are able to get into the supply chain and what's the lifetime of these products like do they i mean they they change i mean you know what i mean like the they they, they can't use the same fertilizer in the same yeah. time correct? so uh, pesticides yeah uh, so yeah, life cycle is a it's kind of a very a hard thing to say and it depends a lot on uh, legislation of different geographies for example like 15 years back organophosphate was a very common insecticide which has been replaced by more upcoming uh, pyrethroids but now uh, in a couple of years we'll go beyond pyrethroids and into the next generation so i guess like every decade it, it changes but at the same time it's not like the older generation gets completely weeded out so most of the pesticides which are available in the market the actual ingredient the the core technical which uh, which which is which is which is making that was invented maybe 50 years ago and now what companies are doing is they are just mixing different ingredients so different grades of technicals and making a new formulation and then testing it out so it's kind of like combination products have become a big thing so in terms of innovation there is very little innovation which happens in producing new technical ingredients innovation mostly happens in mixing these different technicals and then making a new formulation which is kind of also true for pharma uh, a lot of pharma companies also just come up with new clever ways of putting different ingredients in different proportion and then doing clinical trials so similarly acm companies also go through this phase but the core molecules they are like 50 60 years old hey harsh uh, is you know are is there any indication that the chinese are dumping given the slowdown in china or so uh, again it really depends on what you are supplying so if you have long term contracts with your customers mm-hmm. uh, of certain volume per year then you are not impacted by it because the customer anyway has to sell it uh, okay. and and if it's a patented molecule then it's probably he has some kind of brand pull for it uh, so that's not impacted whereas if you are selling in the open market uh, then it's much more of an issue so that's why i i keep on reiterating that if you have the relationships and if you have the registration then it's very hard for someone else to dump it because if it's a patented molecule and uh, you are the supplier to the guy who holds the patent Uh, then it's very hard for him to procure for, from someone else so this becomes a bigger problem for generic technicals uh, such as uh, pyrethroids or organophosphates uh, or these generation of molecules where a lot of other indian company operates so if you look at other indian acm companies most of them are insecticide providers but they make insecticides and most of them make pyrethroids or organophosphates whereas uh, punjab doesn't make insecticides it makes herbicides which are used to kill uh, weeds that that comes out uh, so if you look at the indian acm market versus the global acm market uh, herbicide account for 50% of pesticide production or pesticide consumption in globe whereas it only accounts for 20% in india because in india ma- manual labor is much cheaper so you can have manual labor although that's also increasing but you can have manual labor to pull out the uh, the herbs or the not the herbs the shrubs that come out the, the wild plants whereas uh, in the western uh, economy you cannot have people pulling out 
it's like dirt in the field because that could be too expensive so and uh, punjab mostly makes herbicides they don't make insecticides so the product basket is very differentiated and that's what i also wanted to highlight in the niche molecule segment like the molecules are very differentiated uh, i'll just go back to that slide uh, yeah so they have five to six molecules and all these are very differentiated molecules where there are very few competitors which is also uh, we can also see it here like metamethron diflufenic and thiocyclam nobody else makes it so you don't have uh, competition coming out for these molecules and is there some sort of a, the global slowdown do you think that might impact like short term or yeah so uh, this year actually uh, for them it's been very good because their customers are getting new registrations in different geographies so like even if you look at quarter one sales <coughs> there was a 20 25% growth there just because uh, but yeah once they come to a decent base obviously they will be impacted by macro uh, so far they have not been very impacted because they have got a few new molecules okay but you are saying that overall i guess this there's some growth over the global gdp growth right because oh for sure yeah, for sure yeah, like, because africa yeah, the whole world's kind of yeah and uh, in the broader scale of things this is a very small comp so the top line is 900 crores whereas the global acquire market is 60 billion dollars so this thing they are barely 50 or no they are barely 100 million dollars in sales uh, so they have no market share or very little market share global and just like uh, in terms of i did not talk about future prospects because that would be a bit too speculative but the management is guiding for 1500 crore sales by fy24 and they are at 900 right now so they are, so they are guiding like 60% in one and a half years so they are seeing very strong tailwinds obviously they can be wrong in their projections but that's what they have been guiding for and how do you find the management in general is it they aggressive conservative or very conservative in terms of uh, how they have cleaned up their book i would find i find them very good in some ways because they have kind of reduced all the debt uh, they did not so uh, they at the peak they were 500 crore debt and now they have hardly working gap they have only working capital right and all this has happened without equity dilution so in terms of treatment of minority i'll say very good in terms of execution on uh, capex i sometimes uh, find it hard to understand because if you look at the fixed asset breakup this has not increased but the sales are increasing in a big way so somehow without putting up a lot of capex they are able to grow a lot and at some point this should stop for a manufacturing company uh, so uh, sometimes i feel like they should be more aggressive in putting up more capacities uh, but they seem to be growing without even having the need for that so yeah it just means more free cash flow but at some point this will stop we need to put up more capacity okay Be because i am investing in the other company like transpec and i find they are super conservative it means analysts are joining and they are telling them okay you go and you expand and they are very very conservative they are not expanding at in case of matlab it's it's a bit different for them like most of the analysts are like why are you not putting up more capacity and their answer is like at this capacity we can do this much why do you want me to put more capacity so they are very growth oriented uh, but uh, their growth is not seen on the balance sheet yet uh, but uh -huh. in terms of growth guidance they are very very good uh, so they are guiding for by fy24 of 1500 crores but then they are guiding in three more years we will go to 3000 crores so in terms of growth ambitions the only thing that can go wrong with the company is they become too growth oriented and somehow industry landscape gets spoiled but in terms of growth and mission they are very ambitious yeah but if they want to grow like 30% 35% cagr in next 2 3 years how are they going to grow now then because yeah. if they are not putting any plant and i'm sure it will be lead time will be like one one and a half year to so what they have said in the past so what they have said in the past is we already have all the capex plans to reach 1500 crores oh, wow. once we are once we have that like once we are let's say one year before that so maybe are, we are 1200 crores they then have excess land uh, where they can put up a new plant so they are like we first want to reach 1200 1300 crores and then we'll announce the next stage of capex mm -hmm. okay so uh, most of the analysts have been scratching their heads how can you grow to 1500 crores on these net block right. like that's been that's been the 
case. But uh, in terms of differentiation, most of their molecules are very different from what Indian uh, actin companies produce. And most of these are high realization molecules. So sometimes if you make things which, uh, which you sell for $20 a kg, uh, so just for context, uh, most of the pyrethroid, the most expensive pyrethroid that we have in India is $3 per kg. For them, for Punjab, the average molecule is $20 per kg. So obviously they need low volume uh, because their end realization is very high. Uh, so probably uh, they are just changing the product mix by using the same machinery. Uh, but all this can only go up to a certain level. So management has guided that with the current CapEx plans, they can reach 14, 1400 to 1500 crores, after which they need to do a CapEx and they have excess land for it in their existing capacity. So they won't need to buy a new land for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh, interesting. But yeah, I can uh, see the current. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good. Thank you. Hey, hey, uh, Harsh, uh, Tarun had a question on the chat. Yeah, he's saying, I don't know whether you saw it or. Uh, no, can you just uh, spell? Yeah, it he's out saying. Uh, yeah, what's the reason for the any ideas of the for the reasons behind the recent correction? I was buying. <laughs> when I buy, prices go down. <laughs> but I, I really don't know. I really yeah. don't know. No, I, I know. So uh, I guess. So, like, how would you allocate your capital between, say, between Make Money, Heron Bar, and Punjab, or, or you kind of. I know you're split between Heron Bar and yeah. Punjab, is it? Yeah. So make a uh, Punjab. I've made up my mind uh, that it's. I feel like if they execute their business plan, uh, they have a differentiated strategy because they are making very different high realization molecules on long term contract. So it's a good business model if they're able to execute. Uh, so I feel like for these kinds of companies, I'm uh, ready to pay 15, 16 time earnings. Like. Uh, I feel like they can trade at those multiples because if the market recognizes the true potential and if, they, if it actually delivers what it's guiding, it can be a very, very big, uh, it can be a very good story because here, like the correct competitor for them would be Anupam Rasayan. And Anupam Rasayan trades at 50, 69 multiple. Although it's a new IPO, so you know, like there's always a little, little bit of pumping because of that. In terms of comparison with like Make Money or a Hiran Bar, the biggest difference between Punjab and these uh, companies is Punjab produces herbicides, whereas most of the sales of Make Money and Hiran Bar comes from insecticides. And that too, organophosphate, pyrethroids, uh, and for uh, Make Money also 2,4-D. So uh, these molecules are off patent and there are lots of suppliers for them in India. So in terms of competitive dynamics, I feel like if there is a lot of Another thing we should keep in mind is that the Actium sector has done very well in terms of uh, profitability in the last four, few years. And everybody is putting up huge capex. So we can go into a place where we get a lot of capacity and at some point the capital cycle takes out. Uh, so in, in that circumstance, I feel companies which are making things which, which are differentiated can differentiate themselves. So that's uh, why I feel like uh, companies like Punjab and India pesticides are very differentiated because they are very differentiated molecules. Uh, whereas Meg Money, Hiranba, uh, Bharat Rasayan, most of these are insecticide companies making pyrethroids. Uh, so in, in terms of, uh, but then like, uh, we also have to look at it, like for example, how Meg Money has been able to grow and it's available at single digit multiples. So at some point risk reward may be very favorable there because here you're paying two times the multiple. Whereas there you're paying nothing. So if the growth comes in, everything is for free because you're buying them at a no growth multiple. So that's where I, where I see it. In terms of business, I feel like IPL, India Pesticides and Punjab are differentiated. Uh, they are more uh, in the link of a PI, uh, although not as good so far. Whereas the others are mostly making the same stuff. That's how I see the differentiation.